right, good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? All right, I want you to stand to your feet and worship.
Let's continue to lift him up. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your breath and sang my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. Shackles I wear, I bought on my own. Scarlet sin had a crimson cost, and held my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty. Thank God that stone was rolled away. Lord, I confess I've been a prodigal made for your house, but walked my own road. Then Jesus came, tore down my prison walls, death came to life when he called me by name. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost, you nailed my debt to that. At the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled Scarlet sins had a crimson cost You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled this morning. He is awesome. He is great. He's given us life. He's given us eternity as a gift. That's why we sing. Sing this with us. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where there should be a cask. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers. Rivers of tear flow from good times remember. Families are seen and dancing and laughing. Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound. And the great cloud of witnesses all gather round Cause the ones that were lost are finally found The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Scarlet sins had a crimson cross Nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled. Oh, 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 o
see it now. We're in heaven, Father. I can't imagine a better place. No, there is no better place, Father. We, we on earth have no idea, no idea what it's going to be like. But Lord, we know it's going to be amazing. Father, if we could just get a glimpse of that. Just a glimpse. Father, we love you so much. and robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb there should be a cast the children are seen and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses and blue pushed up from the embers rivers of tears flow from good times are singing and dancing and laughing. Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound, and the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost. Nail my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled.
faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto
to his name there to my heart was the blood of to your name. I'm so thankful to be here this morning, God. I just, I feel your presence. And it is an amazing feeling, God, as we have been singing and worshiping you. I'm just reminded, we have a testimony and we are here on earth to share it and to tell others about you and your amazing name and what you did for us, the blood that you shed for us. We are so undeserving, God, but you did it anyway. You loved us enough and you continue to show us unconditional love. And I thank you for that. I just pray that we can turn our minds and our hearts now to what you have for us through the message and that we will realize we are here to live differently, God. Jesus was just so different and ridiculed here on earth, God, and we are, we are called to be like Jesus. I just pray that we will be bold and brave and that we will do that and we will remember that you did. You covered us with the blood. Thank you for loving us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. How are y'all doing this morning? Blessed, I hope. Listen, I, we cannot worship that way. We can't uh, sing that way and me not say something that's not in the message this morning, uh, at least not directly in the message, and that is this. We are changed by the blood of Jesus. When you think about the Old Testament, you know, a lot of Christians, they just read the New Testament, right? We, we believe in Jesus. Jesus is kind. Jesus is nice. Jesus is, you know, works miracles. And sometimes when we just read the Old Testament, we don't get the full picture. As a matter of fact, if all you've ever read is the New Testament, you cannot get the full picture because you cannot understand the New Testament Savior, Jesus Christ, without understanding what happened in the Old Testament. That God gave a law in the, in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible. We, we see creation, but we see the law of God given to the children of Israel. And we see Israel, we see the Hebrews, the Jews, up and down, up and down. They worship God one moment and then they're, then they're turning their backs on God and they're sending the next as a nation. Up and down, up and down. They go into, into exile. And while they are in Egypt as slaves, God sends Moses, a great man of God, a great uh, prophet, who, by the way, uh, speaking of, of moms that are great moms, you know, Moses' mom had to put him in a basket and float him in the river to keep him alive while his sister watched. And then the person that became Moses' adopted mother was not a Hebrew, was not a Christian, was an Egyptian. The daughter of the Pharaoh saw him, saw this basket floating in the water and took Moses home to be her own son, and God raised Moses up to be a savior, not the savior, but a savior. And you guys, you know the story. 
there's, there's all the plagues, right? Moses comes back to Egypt and he says, Pharaoh, let God's people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And Moses says, fine, this is what's gonna happen. There were, there were plagues of flies and, and frogs and the water turned to blood. There was a plague of darkness. And lots of people were hurt, and, and frankly, I'm sure lots of people, as well as animals, died. And just when Pharaoh said, yeah, you can go, he changed his mind again, and God sent one final judgment. He sent the death angel that was going to come into the nation, come into the camp, and take the life of every firstborn son as punishment for turning their backs on God. But God made a way through that. And it wasn't because you were Jewish. It wasn't that, that you know, it, as long as you're gathered in a Hebrew home, you're going to be okay because God has his hand on, on the Hebrews. It wasn't about where you came from. It wasn't about who your mama was. It wasn't about, frankly, who even your king was, what kingdom that you, that you pledge allegiance to. It was about the blood. For several days, dads would take care of these sheep in the house, these little lambs, and kids would probably give them names. And the reason that they brought them in away from the rest of the flock is because they wanted to make sure that they were spotless, that they didn't get injured, that they didn't get harmed, because it required a spotless lamb whose life was taken, cut his throat, drained his blood, and they cooked up the lamb as a sacrifice. But then they took that blood and they spread it over the, the doorpost, the door frame. And God said that when I send the death angel and he sees your house covered by the blood of the lamb, I will pass over and you will be saved. And that is exactly what happened. God, by the way, God didn't say if you're Hebrew and you put blood on the door. He said if you put blood over the door, if you sacrifice the lamb, your household will be saved. The salvation of God was open even in that moment to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians. Now, most didn't take part. Pharaoh obviously didn't, and he suffered as a result. Listen, Jesus sent his, or God sent his son Jesus to be the lamb slain before the foundation of time. He sent his son because he loves us so much, he doesn't want to see us die and spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell that was not designed for you, but without a doubt, we are all moving in that direction apart from Jesus. But Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and he gave his life. He, he was beaten and abused to the point that he didn't even look like a man. And then they nailed him to a cross and he shed his blood and he breathed his last breath and he died. The lamb died for me died for you, died for all of humanity. But on the third day, he rose again. On the third day, he came back to life. We serve a resurrected Lord. We don't serve some guy in a, in a, in a tomb. We don't worship somebody who used to be alive. We are worshiping the risen Savior, the Lamb of God, who is also the Lion of Judah. If you don't have Jesus in your life, then all those songs that we sang make absolutely no sense. But Jesus applied his blood to save you. So if you've never trusted Jesus as your savior, make this morning that day because God loved us with an agape love and sent his son, Jesus. So we are in week three of the art of being unordinary. And the title of this message, if I were going to give it a title, is For the Sake of Love. We're in the book of Philemon in the New Testament. We're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study over the course of a couple of weeks. And this week is all about love. It's all about that agape love that God showed for us and how we're going to respond to that. 
So as you turn over to, to uh, Philemon, chapter 1, because that's the only chapter. There, there is no other. Uh, we're going to be in verses 8 through 11 this morning. But uh, anybody, anybody in here have a, like a, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or something along those lines that like tracks you know, your health and fitness? I know not everybody does, but a lot of people do. You know, some of you, you know, you want to count your steps and you just have that simple like little physical pedometer that you, you know, you put on your side and you walk and, and, it, and it counts your steps. In all of those, um, in, in this era of apps and, and tracking devices that, that track our health, track our sleep, like I like to know now that I'm not getting enough sleep, so I need to sleep some more, right? I mean, it tells me a lot of stuff. It, with all of those apps, Companies have decided that people will take more advantage of the app, more advantage of the service, if they, what is called, gamify it. If they put some awards and some rewards that if you meet the challenge, if you beat the day before, you get an award. There's a, an app called Pocket, which stores articles from the internet on your phone for later reading. This one has nothing to do with fitness except fitness of the mind. Uh, it informs users as they read when they have read a million words. That's one of the, one of the apps. Um, Fitbit gives users awards such as the 747 badge. Uh, uh, Jeremy, you, you, if you had a Fitbit, you'd be working on this one. Because the 747 badge is given for climbing 4,000 lifetime flights of stairs which rises roughly to the altitude that 747s fly. That's why it's called the 747 badge. I, I say that about Jeremy because he, uh, he loves the step machine. <clears throat> and then of course, you know, you've got the Apple Watch, man. It gives, you a, it gives you an award on your first workout. It gives you an award when you haven't been working out and you finally come back. You know, I love my watch. It says, congratulations, you're still breathing, right? <laughs> Thanks. I stood up 12 times today, I really did something. All right? Why are all of those things in those apps? Why, are, why, is, why, are, why do companies gamify their apps? Because what? Makes us feel good. It's for motivation. Motivation. It motivates us. Listen, when the, when the Bible app, you know, dings and tells me that somebody wants to do a Bible study with me, it's going to cause me to want to dig into the Bible app. When it pops up the verse of the day, there's some motivation there. When it reminds me, hey, you hadn't read me in a while, there's some motivation there. All the apps, it's all about motivation. There are, the companies know that when people are motifi uh, <laughs> motified, motivated to perform, then they'll want to win. They'll want to, you know, at all costs, they, they want to win the award. So most people are motivated by five things. Most people are motivated by five things. These won't be on the screen, but if you, you, know, if you want to take notes and write these down, uh, when, you, when you scour the internet and you look for articles about motivation, psychological articles, health articles, parenting articles, you know, whatever, and, you read, and business articles for leadership and you read about motivation, typically there are, there's, there's more than five, but there's usually five that rise to the top of most of the lists and the first one is power or fear. And the reason I put those two together is because, you know, fear, power, fear motivates a lot of people to do a lot of stupid stuff. But quite frankly, those who are just motivated by power, they're afraid that somebody else might be in charge. They're afraid that somebody else may make a decision. So, and, and it may not be the one that they would make. And so they wanna hang on to that. But we're, we're motivated by the fear of missing out, right? Fear motiva motivates a lot of people. The second one is achievement. Achievement, that's what all those apps do. It's setting goals and then meeting the goals. That's a good thing to motivate us is to set some goals and meet those goals. Another motivation is personal growth. Personal growth, it's very similar to the, to the achievement, but personal growth is about just getting better at something. It may be open-ended, I wanna be a better reader, I wanna be a better father, I wanna be a better mother, and so I just wanna to, to make myself better. That's personal growth, motivates a lot of people. I don't know anybody that's not motivated by winning. That's number four. 
winning. We want to win, sometimes at all costs, and it hurts when we lose, right? We, we love to win, and you've probably heard this quote before, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? We live our lives that way often because we want to win. Number five, belonging. The sense of knowing that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, that we can connect with someone, that somebody cares, that we belong. I would say that many of you are here this morning because you feel like you belong to the church at Lake Forest. You were welcomed when, when you came in the door and somebody knows your name, gave you a hug, shook your hand. It might happen on the way back out the door. A bunch of us will hang around for like an hour after service just talking because we're motivated by that feeling of belonging. These are all great motivations. There's nothing, well, I don't say there's nothing wrong with any of them. There's nothing wrong with a lot of them. They could all motivate us towards sin, but they can also all motivate us toward God. But in all the lists that you scour and in those, in those five things that I listed for you, there's one motivation that doesn't show up that we're going to talk about today, the most important motivation, and that is love, specifically agape love. We talked a little bit about that last week. You know, a lot of us would be motivated by what the Bible would would call phileo love, like the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Phileo love is, is loving somebody and doing something for them. And frankly, you expect something in return. That's that feeling of belongingness. You know, not that like, you know, if I give a gift, they're gonna give a gift back, but but if I love on them and invest in their lives, then then I want them to, to love me too. That's phileo love. But agape love, agape love is loving someone unconditionally, even if they choose to never love you back. That's agape love. That's the kind of love that God gave to us. He chose to love us and many people, I would say more people don't love God than do love God. And God sent his son Jesus to die for us because he loves us with agape love. So we've been studying through this book of of Philemon, and in case you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, uh, Paul is writing this letter from prison, and he's actually, he's written another letter at the same time as the book that we call Colossians. He wrote a letter to the church at at Colossae, and uh, he also wrote this letter to Philemon, and the church meets in his house, all right? That's Philemon. The other person in the letter, the, the primary person, his name is Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave who met up with Paul at some point, trusted Jesus as his savior, and now Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon and is asking Philemon to accept him as a brother in Christ, which was absolutely unheard of. And so we're gonna pick up in in, uh, verse eight this morning. It'll be up on the screen. Paul says this, therefore, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. All right, now I gotta pause for a second and look at that very first verse that we read, verse eight. It says, therefore. Now if you've never been taught this, you need to learn this lesson. Anytime you read therefore in the Bible, you gotta ask yourself the question, what is it there for, right? There's there's a reason that it's there, that Paul's about to ask this, make this request based on what he's already said and to review what he's already said. He's been like high-fiving Philemon. Philemon is a great Christian leader. He's opened his home uh, to, to the church to meet in his home. His wife and his son are serving in the church with him. And we learned last week that Paul recognized Philemon for being so unordinary in love. He, was an or- he had an ordinary faith in Jesus. And because of his love and his faith in Jesus, he was He had already entered into these unordinary partnerships to to spread the gospel and to grow the kingdom. 
And then, and then Paul has been praying for his, an ordinary understanding and the fact that, that Philemon brought calmness in the midst of chaos. Paul's already said, Philemon, you're living this way and this is awesome. High five, therefore, because of that, Philemon, what I'm about to say to you is gonna test the bounds of our friendship. Philemon, what I'm about to say to you, I'm gonna ask you to do something that in our world is the opposite of what anybody else would do. But it's exactly what we should do in the kingdom. You've been great, Philemon, continue to be great. And he makes this request. Onesimus is a slave. We talked about slavery in week one. I wanna encourage you to go back and watch that, watch that week. Uh, I gave a biblical perspective of slavery. Uh, but Onesimus is a slave, which a lot existed then. Still around the world today, there, there are slaves. Um, and Onesimus apparently belonged to Philemon. He's stolen from Philemon, he's run away, and what should happen is when he's returned, at the very least, he should be punished. But because Philemon owns him as a slave, he could choose to take his life in, in retribution and in punishment for what Onesimus has done to him. That's what most of the world would do. But that's not the way that Paul is saying we should act in the kingdom. What, what Paul is saying to Philemon is, you already know what to do. You've been doing it. Just keep doing it, Philemon. Just keep doing it. Welcome, welcome Onesimus back in. And what I love is in verse nine, Paul says, actually it, it, it's in verse eight and nine. Uh, he says that he could have ordered Philemon to do the right thing. He could have pointed his finger and spoken in authority. He could have been Paul, an apostle of Christ. But Paul says, I am Paul, a slave in shackles to Jesus. I exist because Jesus loves me. And I'm not appealing to you for my authority as an apostle. I could tell you what to do and you would have to do it. I'm not appealing to you because of that. I'm appealing to you as a friend, as Paul, through love, through this agape love. Paul understands a couple of things that we need to understand this morning. Number one is this, moral authority and knowledge are not enough to be unordinary. Moral authority and knowledge are not enough to be unordinary. Do I want you to be a moral authority? Absolutely, I pray that you are the most moral person that you know. Do I, do I want you to have great knowledge? Yes, I think most people should go to college and if you don't do that, then you're learning a trade, you're learning something, but your life should be dedicated to, to growing in knowledge and in wisdom and in serving God as you, as you learn something new and you put that, that into practice. But that's not most important. I mean, Paul says, I've got all the authority to make you do this and, and Philemon, he knows the right thing to do, but, but, but Paul is saying, listen, I, I could make you do it, right? I could, I could order you to do it, but I'm not gonna force it. Because in that instance, what Paul would be setting up is a win-lose scenario. If you do what I tell you to do, you're winning. If you don't, you're losing. Paul doesn't set up that win-lose scenario. And the reason that he doesn't is because he understands what happens when we assert moral authority and knowledge and not agape love. What Paul understands is that in just a short amount of time, what will probably happen is that Philemon will come to, he'll do the right thing, he'll do the right thing. But eventually, Philemon will come to resent Paul and resent Onesimus. There, there's a possibility, a strong possibility of that. How do I know that? Because we're like that. <laughs> I'm like that. Somebody tells me what I have to do, I might go and do it, but I'm like, oh, stupid little, you know? <laughs> we, we, we resent 
people. When somebody orders us to do something, we, we resent them. It's as if they, they force us to follow their orders. Just being motivated by being right all the time and being motivated by winning almost always leads us to sin. Just being motivated by being right all the time and being motivated by winning most often leads us to sin. Proverbs 17, 19 puts it this way. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Now, I've read that proverb a million times, but the way, because I read Proverbs every year a couple of times a year, so I know I've read it probably at least 50 times in my life. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. If you just like to argue for argument's sake, you got to get the last word in, right? You always want to win. You always, you know, whatever somebody else says, you got to follow it back and, and prove your point. Prove that you have the moral authority. Prove that you have the knowledge. You know better than they do. And you push and you push and you push. What you are doing is you are loving a quarrel, which means that you love sin. Let that sink in just a second. I don't think anybody came this morning to church and thought, man, I'm going to love some sin today. No. But that's how we act. When somebody tells us what to do, we, we are resentful. And when we are convinced that we're in the right, we'll fight about it. We'll argue about it. And listen, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that when we're right, we should change our minds and be wrong just because, Proverbs says to, or, or, or Jesus says to. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. We should still be right, but there's a way that we, that we act in our righteousness. Philemon already knows what he should do, but we've always, all of us, have always had a problem uh, practicing what we know we should do. All right? All of us have a problem practicing what we know we should do. No amens to that. I know what I should do. I don't always do that. Uh, you know you're supposed to read your Bible. You don't always do that. You know that we're supposed to be a praying church. We don't always do that the right way. We don't always do what we, what we know to do. And even though we know we're right, even though moral authority and knowledge are on our side, I just want you to understand, moral authority and knowledge is on your side. You've trusted Jesus as your Savior. You're a student of the Word of God. You're following God. By, by, by reading what others have, have written, and you're walking with Christ, you have moral authority and knowledge. It is on your side. But just because you have moral authority and knowledge doesn't mean that you can force someone to do the right thing. We can't force someone to do the right thing. It's their decision, not our decision. We gotta remember that. Number two, if you're taking notes, as we are motivated by agape love, unordinary people are motivated by agape love. Unordinary people are motivated by agape love. Instead of being motivated by authority and motivated by knowledge, we're motivated by this agape love. Why? Because people who are motivated by agape love, they do things, they, they make decisions because they care, because it's right. Because it's the way that God said that we should do it. They live their lives according to the love of God. Agape love creates expectations and imposes obligations that cannot be mandated or calculated. People who are motivated by agape love are set free to do what nobody else would expect them to do. Because agape love is open-ended and uncontrollable. Nobody expected God to send his son to sacrifice his one and only son, Jesus. But his love knows no bounds. It is uncontrollable. It is open-ended. God's arms are open to welcome the world and any who want to come, the door is open. All you have to do is trust Jesus as your savior. And that's the kind of love that Paul is appealing to the heart of Philemon. Philemon, you've been doing it. You know the right thing to do. Just keep, keep loving. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you have agape love. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you have the Spirit in you, the Spirit of God. You have agape love. It is a part of who you are. 
We just have to learn how to act in it. Philemon was, was already doing that. What Paul is asking Philemon to do is, uh, is unheard of, but it's exactly what needed to happen in the kingdom of God. It was unheard of in the world out there, but it's exactly what should have happened in the kingdom of God. And just kind of as a side note, I love how Paul says, I'm just an old man. Did y'all notice that one? You know, I'm appealing to you as Paul, an old man and a prisoner in, in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be amazing if all old people were full of the love of Jesus instead of being grumpy? I'm not saying that all old people are grumpy, but you know, the older I get, the grumpier I seem to be. I remember several years ago, uh, I, was, I, was, I had a friend in children's ministry, I was involved in children's ministry for, for 17 years, and uh, she was talking to me about possibly coming to her church and serving at her church. And apparently she talked to her pastor, and the question that the pastor asked was simply this, he's not grumpy, is he? Like, he just wanted to make sure that if somebody was going to join his team, and by the way, I never went to that church, but he wanted to make sure that if somebody was going to join his team, that they would have a positive attitude. And Paul here is saying, listen, I'm old, but I'm, I'm chained to, to Jesus. I'm a, I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm not old and grumpy. I have agape love. Paul's been captured by the love of God. Philemon and Onesimus have been captured by the love of God. And now Paul is saying, just do what you've been doing in the kingdom. Don't stop doing it when it comes to Onesimus. See, we would say like, oh, this, this must have been so easy for Philemon. This was, you know, I would, I would always do what Paul is asking me to do. But how often do we really do that? How often do we try to be kind and gracious to everyone? Well, you would probably all say, I want to do that all the time. I try to be kind and gracious to everybody all the time, except for that one guy. Except for the person in front of me in the line who won't order fast enough. Except for the person who's fixing my food, they don't fix it fast enough. Except for my favorite one, AT&T. I cannot stand calling AT&T customer service. I try to be nice, I try to be calm, but when I pick up that phone, uh, it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating. It's hard to always show agape love. But what, what Paul is saying to Onesimus and what God is saying to us today is that in every way, in everything that you do, yeah, you may be right. AT&T may owe you $400. But, right? But that doesn't give us an excuse to be unkind. This is hard for me. I don't know if it's hard for you, but this is, this is hard for me. I said many times that, that you don't want to meet Chris without Jesus because Chris without Jesus in a dark alley is not the guy that you want to talk to. At my core, I am not a nice person. At my core, I am full of sin. I'm full of anger. I'm full of rage. And I would love to take it out on anybody who stands in my way. That's who I am before Jesus. But because of Jesus... God motivates me by his agape love so that when somebody gets up in my face, and y'all know I work in the staffing industry, and man, I've been cussed up one side and down the other, called nothing but a racist white boy. I mean, just, you know, everything. I mean, in my face. Yes, sir, I understand. I'm just trying to help you, right? <laughs> 20 years ago, I'd probably kill somebody. But the love of Jesus has grown in me. And so then Paul says to Philemon uh, in, in verse 11, he's, he's calling this agape love out of Philemon. And, and then Paul gives us this little play on words. Let's read uh, verse 11 again. It'll be on the screen. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Onesimus' name, his name actually means useful or profitable. And with a little play on words, Paul is saying to Philemon, listen, he used to be useless, but now he is useful. Onesimus used to be, like me, at his core, sinful. Onesimus used to be a completely worthless person. 
Without Christ, we're all there. And what Paul is pointing out is now Onesimus is living out. He is the person that God created him to be. So Philemon accept him. Listen, that should be all of us. When we, cho when we choose Jesus as our savior, he changes us from the inside out. We are no longer the person that we used to be. We are now the person that God created us to be. That's what agape love looks like, is loving, changing. Very quickly, I just wanna close with this. There are three things that I think an ordinary people who practice agape love do. An ordinary people are aware of their tone when you're talking to somebody. And ordinary people are aware of their tone. How we talk to others is important, especially when we're talking about sensitive things. Like Paul is having this conversation about slavery, about a slave to a slave owner. It's a sensitive conversation. That's a sensitive conversation today. And our, the tone that we use when we wanna lean in close to somebody, if it is if it's demeaning, if it's pointing our fingers, if it's judgmental, that's not the tone that's gonna change someone's mind. An ordinary people are aware of their tone. Paul changed his tone, remember? Paul said, hey, I, I, I could have addressed you as Paul the apostle and told you what to do, but I'm gonna change how I address you. I'm gonna be Paul, your friend, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He changed his tone. Number two, an ordinary people care about winning people, not winning debates. An ordinary people care about winning people, not winning debates. This is agape love. James 4.12 says, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, do we judge things all the time? Yes, when Jesus said in the book of Matthew, judge not lest you be judged, about 10 times in that chapter, Jesus judges things and judges people. But when we approach people with a judgmental attitude, that is what God is telling us we need to leave behind us, that, that attitude, that tone of, of judgment. We never, not one time will we ever accept sin and call it truth. We will always have the moral authority. We will always walk in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We will always say the word over the world. We will not believe what the world tells us to believe just because everybody else is doing it. We're gonna trust in God. We're not gonna exchange truth for a lie. But even though we, we won't accept the sin as truth, but we should accept sinners. And yes, we share them the truth within the truth, but we show them agape love. That's what God did for us. He didn't wait for you to agree with him. He didn't wait for you to be perfect. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you had to be perfect to trust Jesus as your savior, none of us would ever get there. Number three, an ordinary people are sensible, not stubborn. They're not grumpy old men. They're not old and set in their ways. Instead, be old and sit in Christ. Remember that, that name Onesimus meaning useful. Be useful. Stubbornness is not useful. It's useless. And what Paul is saying to Philemon is don't be stubborn, right? Don't, 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 be, don't be this way, Philemon. Be this way. Be gracious, be loving, be, be sensible. That is agape love. If you will, all around the room, just close your eyes and bow your heads. I want to pray for us this morning. But also want to point back to the gospel. Because without the gospel, Philemon would not be where he was. Paul wouldn't be where he was. Onesimus wouldn't be where he was. I wouldn't be here today apart from the gospel, apart from the fact that Jesus lived and died and rose again. If you're sitting here this morning and you have never trusted Jesus as your savior, don't let today pass you by. Today is a great morning 
to trust Jesus. So I want to pray for you. And if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, as I pray, pray this in your mind as well. Make this your prayer to God. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. And I believe that you rose again. Jesus, I believe in you. I put my faith and trust in you. Not in the toys of the world, not in what the world would tell me I should believe, but it's in you. Jesus, I may not understand everything. but I understand your love. You love me enough to die for me, and that's good enough for me. Jesus, I trust you. Thank you for being my savior. God, thank you for calling me your child, your son, your daughter. And I will live the rest of my life seeking to serve and honor you. Listen, if that was your prayer this morning, Come tell, come tell me, tell somebody. You know, grab one of the worship team, talk to them if you're friends with them. My, my sweet, beautiful mom is back at our, in our prayer room, at our prayer wall. If you wanna go talk to her, she would love to talk to you and encourage you in your salvation. Don't leave this morning without doing that. Lord Jesus, we humbly bow ourselves before you this morning. And we ask the question, what is motivating me? Please show me and remove from me anything that gets in the way of the love you have placed in me and called me to practice. I confess my tone towards those who see the world differently is damaging. It's damaging to the church, it's damaging to the kingdom. And I confess that I would rather win the debate to feed my pride than win the person for your name's sake. I confess that as sin to you. God, I confess that I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn, stubborn with people when I know I should be sensible. Forgive me, God. Forgive me of these attitudes and actions. Transform me into an unordinary person who reflects the attitudes behaviors of Jesus Christ. God, thank you so much for loving me in spite of myself. And it is in Jesus' loving name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Y'all have a great Mother's Day.